Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. Welcome back, Richard Swanson, and Thank welcome you. for the first time, Murray Hart. Thank you. Good feels to be like here. an oversight that we haven't had you here <laughs> here before. It's good to be here. Thank you're, you. You're a busy person, so we appreciate uh, you coming down and coming down together. And we ask you together because you have this relationship with each other that also includes <laughs> conversations about faith. So I feel like I should almost step out of the room and just let you guys talk. But I want to set the stage for what we've been um, talking about here on the show, which is the future of faith in South Dakota. And we've been looking at statistics of the number of people who no longer identify with any faith, the increase of new faiths like Hinduism to the state of South Dakota that maybe were not here in the numbers that they're here now, um, and people who have left the church, um, predominantly the Christian church is who we've talked to who have said, it's not for me anymore, I don't like the politics, I don't like the ritual or, or what have you that they don't like people who have come back to the church. Um, and so I want to start there with this idea of the numbers say fewer and fewer people, especially young people, are associating themselves with any kind of faith. Are you seeing that? in, in your When you look around, do you see students? Has, have things sort of changed? Um, you know, you both teach at a traditionally Lutheran college. Um, Murray Har, start with, with you, please. I think in the years I've taught at Augustana, it seems to me more and more students are less involved with uh, Christian tradition and Christian faith. When I first came here, uh, I think most of the students were either Lutheran or Roman Catholic, and a few students maybe who were different or didn't, didn't, didn't believe. Uh, but now I think I would say a good 20% of the students that I have have grown up with no religion at all. Hmm. I mean, it isn't even that they're against religion, it's that their parents just did not bring them up with any religion. And then you have students who are Lutheran and Roman Catholic who don't know much about their tradition. I mean, they're not quite sure why they're Lutheran or why they're Catholic. Uh, and so when, we, when I teach exploring the Christian faith and we get into just the basics of what it means to be Christian, they're shocked by some of this. They don't, they don't understand it. Uh, they had certain stereotypes about it. Hmm. Um, it really is a different set of students these days. And we have a number of people who are atheists as well. And, uh, and it's fascinating in class because now you have to open the discussion. You yeah. can't assume everybody's Christian. And you have to discuss why should we even bother to study the Bible? Why should we even bother to talk about God? And it raises these questions, which are, I would say years ago, you just didn't have to do it. I think I see the same thing, but I, I think that what's changed is the institutional connection of, of students. They are institutionally disconnected. They are sometimes passionately connected to an institution for sometimes very brittle reasons. But the questions that are underneath the things we study seem just as interesting and just as relevant. Um, but you begin the discussion without the assumption that everyone has learned the, the, mm. the terminology. But the questions, I think, are the same. Uh, how does this hold together? How, how do you make sense? How, what do you hope for? What do you dare hope for? Um, how and wh does, and how why bother? I'm sorry? And why bother? I and mean, in some bother? ways, you have to answer that question now yes. in a way that you didn't do. Or do you? Do you have a responsibility I, as a professor to say, why bother to answer yes. that I, question? I start off like this. I say, yeah. why bother to study this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, what God don't you believe in? Because you usually have to ask, what do you mean by the word God? Where you're, because you've got people who believe in God, but it's really strange when you start to hear what God they believe in. Yeah. And then you have people who don't believe in God. And when you ask them what they don't believe in, you go, yeah, I'm not sure I would believe in that God either. Don't, so you, Maybe you, no one should. Maybe <laughs> no one should. Yeah. So I think this you have to start off with, I go through all the reasons we ought not to study. And then I say, and yet, what if there's some truth here? What if there's something that this, this tradition is pointing us to that we need to pay attention to if we care about truth? And then you say, okay, well, maybe there's something there. If you can get them to just say, maybe there's something there, then I think it, they'll, they'll walk with you. Yeah. And what it is, it is really a different kind of student. The questions, you're right, the questions are the same, but the, but this, this, this is a really different kind of student. You have to justify. People say, why should I care about the story with Abraham? Right. Who cares? And why is that story important? And it's really, I mean, it, it, 
it's, it's just a different way of approaching it, even though the questions remain the same. And in some ways, where we start now is where we worked to get 20 years ago. Mm. Yes. Because if people simply accept it because they always have accepted it and their faith is as real as the wallpaper in their mom's dining room, they haven't thought about that. Now, now the thought, the questions are live and open. And yeah. that's, that's what we always worked for back 20 years ago. So when somebody comes to a scriptural story for the first time, you mentioned Abraham, and I'm thinking mm. of Abraham and Isaac, and this, you know, going up and, and being told to sacrifice his son. Mm. If you mm. if you learn some kind of version of that when you're little, and it's it sort of floats in your head as something you always wondered about, that's got to be very different from reading that story when you're 19 and saying. Y'all believe what? You know, like, what is what is this thing telling me? How do you wrestle with some of those really difficult um, stories that just had, we have a hard time making sense of them today? I think in Hebrew Scripture in particular. In Hebrew Scripture. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, Dick and I, we've talked that we've taught a class together, a seminar on yeah. what's called the Akedah. This is the story of, it's called in, in Jewish tradition, the binding of Isaac. It's a very puzzling story. Why would God, who just bothered to make a covenant with Abraham that involved land and lots of babies, and, who fi and finally he gets a child, and now he tells, take the child and kill the child. And it really raises questions about the justice of God. Uh, it raises questions about the way Abraham operates in all this. He doesn't even tell Sarah, and he's taking the kid to, to kill the kid. And then the question becomes, in this story of, of, of Isaac being sacrificed, who's testing who? Because the traditional story wants to say, it's God testing Abraham to see if he's willing to kill his child. Now there's parts of Jewish tradition that say, no, no. What's really happening is Abraham believed God, and he was testing to see who would blink first. And in the end, it was God who blinked, and Abraham nodded and said, of course, I thought so. So it's an interesting, so when you deal with a story like that, you have to allow the questions. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's really a puzzling story. Uh, and yet, why did they include it? What's the purpose of this story? Yeah. And one of the most important things about a, a story like that is to invite students to have honest reactions to it. Uh, um, if they come in wanting to know what the right answer to their, from their tradition is, they will always end up not reading the story, but reading something that's been sanitized. Stories like that are for the purpose of provoking questions. From the beginning, they are for the purpose of provoking questions. Read the rabbis on, on the Akedah. They have, been, they have been asking wonderfully rude questions from the beginning. And so if you, if you believe that the only possible faithful response is an extremely polite and well-behaved uh, refusal to ask questions, you have not entered the actual biblical tradition. So it's nice to have someone in the room who's never read the story before. Because That's not what I was taught. Uh -huh. Yes. So many people who grew oh, up in the Christian church, I don't know about your tradition, but in my tradition, you didn't ask questions. Yeah. I mean, I'm not insulting any of my Sunday school teachers, but you were the one, you were the troublemaker if you asked too many <laughs> questions in Sunday school. I was raised in a family that believed that's how you're faithful. Yeah. I was lucky. Yeah, that's nice. And I went to a school where we were taught mm -hmm. that the purpose of these stories was to evoke questions. Yeah. When I came to teach at Augustana, what I discovered is, at least at the beginning, many of the students were taught that questions are the opposite of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I grew up in a tradition where questions were at the heart of faith. Yeah. That if you really believed, you would have questions. And the, and the, and the deeper that you trusted, the deeper your questions would be. And, wow. and I grew up in a family where if everyone around the table agreed, my father took ridiculous positions so that we would have to ask questions, which is why yeah. we've discovered early we get along with each other very well, because we seem to have been raised in the same faith in different traditions. I think that's right. Yeah. I think you can, you can f be threatened by the questions, mm -hmm. or you can embrace the questions and say, now nah, we're really getting. The rabbis believe that these stories were written to evoke questions. Who are we asking the questions of? The answer to that is yes, okay. <laughs> because the questions yeah. are, are that big. Yeah. Um, the questions, you're asking the questions of God, because in the story, God asks something that no, no, no human being should say yes to. And that means you have to ask questions of God. Uh, in the cr Christian tradition, there is uh, 
also a tradition of asking questions. Nils Dahl, who was my doctoral advisor's doctoral advisor, noted that in the Akedah, you suddenly, if, if the heart of faith is discovering and, and trusting the promises of God, in the Akedah, God is the obstacle to the promises of God. And that requires you to ask very hard questions about what you, what you mean when you say the word God. But you also have to ask questions of a story like that, of any human system that supports that kind of child sacrifice. So Wilfred Owen's poem, he was a poet in the First World War who wrote good poetry in the trenches, picks up the Akeda, only the Isaac who is laid on the altar and ultimately killed, the young men of Europe who are laid on the altar by their fathers whose pride would not let them bend. Mm. And the story sets up those questions too because human systems are very glad to sacrifice young people to uh, old men's pride. Mm. What's your earliest memory of faith that you now as an adult realize was part of your faith tradition? But maybe at the time you didn't realize that this was part of your faith tradition. Here, here's what I think is probably where, what comes up mostly, and it's early, very early. My father was a scientist. He taught agriculture, but he was a scientist. And the world was full of plants and animals, all of them creations of God. And he was fascinated by the world with its complexity. And so walking with him in a field or going on a hike with him or walking out at, at night looking at stars, every plant would reach out and grab his pant leg and say, ooh, 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 tell a story about me. <laughs> and I realized that his sense of wonder at the, at the connections of the natural world was very much faith. And so when he taught me that a scientist knows what she knows and knows what she doesn't know and asks questions about the things that she doesn't know. When my, when my dad taught me that, he was teaching me what faith really was for him. You ask the hardest questions you can so that you can know things as well as they can be known and when they can't be known, you know that. Hmm. that that's, that's probably the root of, of it for me. Hmm. I think um, I grew up in rather a strange uh, apartment in the Bronx where my parents were really, the, they were survivors of the Holocaust. Yeah. And I think we didn't have any relatives, so there were certain categories you didn't have. Grandparents, uncles, cousins, we just didn't have any. Uh, and near as we knew, everybody had been killed. So there was rarely any company that came over. But I'm trying to think, you know, for me, a faith was always mixed up with th that event in those days. Uh, I remember my father, and he says because you mentioned your dad, I remember my father screaming in the middle of the night. And, I, and he, I went in and he's saying this Jewish prayer called the Shema, which is very traditional for Jews to say, particularly before they die, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. And he's saying this in Hebrew. And, I'm, and I'm, he's, I, I mean, I walked into the living room, he's sitting in the chair and he's sweating and he's... And I asked him, I said, Dad, what's going on? And he says, I'm not going to tell you, because if I tell you, you will have it in your eyes. And he never did. He was a person who believed in God, but who lived with the struggle of believing in God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it, for him it was simple, but I just don't think he ever wanted to pass that on to me. I mean, and yet he did, because to me, I'm in just embroiled in these questions because of his experience uh, because of growing up with no one there. So faith has always been uh, not so much a because, but a despite. Mm. You know, despite what's happened, I continue to trust. And exactly what do I trust? And what is the nature of my trust? And what questions does my trust bring? I think these are really a part of what it means to be faith. And this is what we're teaching students, is to have, uh, if you're going to have faith, let it be an intelligent faith. You don't need a faith. A simple faith may be not what you're after, but faith should be intelligent. It should be. It should trust without knowing for sure, mm -hmm. and that that's what faith is. It's trusting without knowing for sure. If you knew for sure, you wouldn't have to trust. 
but trusting without knowing for sure. And that's very hard for students because I think they want either A, some certainty, uh, or, or an atheist student who comes to me and says, Dr. Har, uh, when, you t when you show me that it's really true, then I'll believe. And of course, I don't have that proof. So I try to tell them, you know, faith is trusting without knowing for sure. And there are going to be these things in your life where that's what, you, that's what it's about. And I think this is, was my dad. I mean, you talk about your dad. That was my dad. I think they believed. I think he, you know, he kept to tra tradition. But I think he was always aware of the, of the fragility of the tradition. Do you wish he had told you more? You know, I think every, every child of survivors wishes that, that the father or the mother would have said more. My parents just did not talk about it, and they couldn't see why. Yeah. Their notion was these were terrible things. Why do we want to rehearse them? In the 1990s, when I visited the camps in Europe, my mother was puzzled. Why are you doing this? Why do you want to look at that? It's, it was awful. We never talk about it. Yes, your, your dad, you, he would scream in the middle of the night, but we never talk about that here. So only later... After they died, did I find some record of what they had been through? Oh. I was astounded how, how they had kept this quiet to themselves and just refusing. And this was not this is not uncommon. Many of the survivors just refused to tell their children what happened. Yeah. But I think faith then became mingled with its own fragility. It's just there, there was a recognition that trusting is not that simple if you have in some way been betrayed. Yeah. And I think that's just, and that's true in all relationships. But it's certainly true here, and it really, in the way uh, Dick was talking about his faith, I think, in the same way, I think. And, and, and when we had these discussions with each other, we would share some of this. You know, we had many lunches where we talked about these and, and went through this. And he, said, and he would listen to that, and, he, and I would listen to his way of understanding faith. Which is, and we found there were so many commonalities because we both grew up uh, being taught to embrace the questions. Yeah. And do you need a break where you're just like, let's just talk about the weather for a while? Or, or do you never, like, I guess what I'm kind of getting at in a broader question, it sounds like a flippant question, but it's not. Because what I'm wondering is, is there a time when you're in this deep, heavy stuff, either this is what happened to my parents in the Holocaust, this is what anti-Semitism looks like in America today, this is what Christians have done um, to persecute other people. Is there a point that you need to step aside and say, I need to live in the present and, uh, you know, experience the joy of a blue South Dakota sky or something? That's kind of where I'm, where I'm getting yeah. at with, uh, you know, when is, how do you balance that? In, in our conversations, some of the balance happens because arguing with a good arguing partner, that's a, a good arguing partner is a gift from God, um, is such a joy that even the hardest arguments are feel like what we were made for and feel like a chance to learn the things that you plain have to learn to be a human being. So mm -hmm. part of the answer is arguing through the hard pieces with a good arguing partner is itself deeply joyful. But you notice we go out for lunch to do that so that we can eat delightful food um, because in the middle of a world full of horrors, there are delights that save your life. And those, those, are, as, those are as crucial to the, to the exploration as the exploration itself. Because you can't just grind down into the horror, but you can't run from it because, because we have children that we have to tell the truth to about, about what faith is and isn't. And we have students that we owe the truth to. Um, and we have students who have seen horrors that we don't know about. Mm. And therefore, we have to understand them as well as we can so that when they raise their hand and say, but what about, we have been there to think about it. Mm. As a teacher, you owe them that. Um, otherwise, otherwise, all we're handing them is, is fragile stuff that will break or already has broken in their own lives. I mentioned anti-Semitism, mm. and people in America have been horrified by the rise in hate crimes against Jews in this country. And we've talked about it on this program um, inadequately, frankly, because the one time we talked about it, I lost it on live radio and, and never recovered. Um, so it's a very difficult thing. 
how do you approach it as a Jewish man living in South Dakota, teaching these students when there is a shooting, when there is, you know, uh, we understand, you know, there's Nazi flyers passed out on a campus or, uh, you know, in a location in the city. Um, do they come to you for words of wisdom? Yeah, I don't know if I have uh, a great deal of wisdom, but I try, I think they are puzzled by it, particularly yeah. when we study the Holocaust, what motivates hatred? And I think a lot of people think it's a matter of education. I, I think it is not a matter of educating people because I think uh, this kind of hatred of Jews is almost a kind of faith. Uh, there are people who believe certain things about Jews, and you're not going to convince them that it's wrong, and, and they're not necessarily open to hearing. So uh, this kind of hatred is very deep. Now, if you ask me, is it ever possible to turn it around? Yes, I think the way you turn hatred around is experience, meaning you meet somebody and you discover, son of a gun, he's a person, <laughs> look at him, he's got ears, he's got a nose, he's got eyes, he's, uh -huh. he laughs, he makes mistakes, he's a person. Yeah. And I think, you know, all these years that we started off playing racquetball and we started off having lunch and, 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 and challenging each other and backing up and then challenging again and backing up, uh, and 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 learning learning that the other person is human, yeah. that's quite something. Uh, I I think that this is not just an a, a, an other, but it's a person. He's not a perfect person. He's a flawed person, but he's a person. Now I think you can change hatred, but sometimes people who hate, you it's very hard to get out of that box. Uh, and 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 I try to teach my students that uh, you know don't don't get in the box, but at least be aware of it. People who hate are sure they're right, and they're sure that what they believe is the truth. Mm -hmm. And once you're certain about that, mm -hmm. I'm afraid it's very hard to, uh, to go against that kind of certainty, uh, because even the attempt to argue about it is already an attempt that's, that, that doesn't really understand the truth that I have. I have this truth about the Jews. So I just think it, and, and it's hard in this part of the world because there aren't many Jews running around. I mean, South Dakota has about 300 Jews. I mean, not many people. You meet people, but not many, yeah. uh, as opposed to the Twin Cities, where there are something like 30,000 Jews. So it, it's very hard here to gain experience. Um, I remember being in, a, I won't say which town, but I was in a small town in South Dakota, and I was doing a talk on Jew, Jewish roots of Christian tradition. Fairly not controversial. <laughs> yeah. A man came up to me after the talk and he said, you know, Dr. Har, you are a nice person. I really like you, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm still scared of Jews. I was the only Jew he'd ever met. So somehow here's this guy in a small town in South Dakota, and he's scared of Jews. The Jews are going to hurt him. And even though he met me and he said, you're a nice guy, he thought, this is the exception. Mm. They, they are not all like that. So I, I think you're, it's, a, it's a very hard subject um, to talk about. I mean, we try to talk about it, but I don't think it's a matter of just education. Yeah. But there are, there are pieces that are a matter of education as, um, as a Christian. Um, some of that, that fella in South Dakota, in small town South Dakota, some of that is just societal. Every community generates an other that they are afraid of. And that'll happen... Were there no Jews in the world, there would have been someone that he was afraid of because we do that. But some of that is rooted in the way Scripture has been read by Christians. And I, therefore, as a Christian teacher, as a, as a pastor, have absolute responsibilities to call that out and make it visible um, because some of, some, of the ways that, some of the ways that Scripture has been read are deadly, and some of the ways that, that Scripture even has been written are deadly, because there are preserved fights between uh, faithful people who believe Jesus was significant or believed he was not, that got enshrined inside Scripture in ways that are, that are deadly and wrong. And I have a responsibility to call those out. And not, not just because we're friends, but on account of Murray's down the hall from my office, I got someone who will ask me if I've called him out. Mm -hmm. 
But it's, it's an absolute responsibility for Christians to look at those and see what's been done with them and to call them what they are. Can you give me an example? In the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is a complex, layered text that for the last century and a half has been recognized to be a composite text that's put together out, out of several different streams of tradition. One of the streams is very angry, especially at Jews. And in that stream, characters that are carefully identified as Jewish hear Jesus call them to their faces, children of their father, the devil. Mm. Now, it doesn't matter. The, the complexity of the document of the Gospel of John matters to me as a student of the text. But those words are there whether I argue against them or not. And those words have been deadly. And if I say anything less than that to my students, I have cheated them. Mm. And given, given the effect of those words, whoever wrote them, when you get to heaven, ask around. Whoever wrote them was wrong. And if Jesus said that, um, Gospel of John is not a good place to go find, to find quotations from Jesus. The tradition is heavily uh, embellished. But should Jesus have said those, he was wrong. So we, one of the things we argue about is what can we do about such texts? So, I mean, I have my students read the Gospel of John, and we talk about them, but, you know, we've argued, should we, should we excise it? Should right. we just get rid of it? Tear that page out. Tear that page yeah. out, you know, but you can't. It's the yeah. Bible. It's, it's still part, of, part of the Scripture. So I, I try to teach my students, look at the way this has been interpreted. Look at what people have done with these texts that you're reading here as required, but look what's happened here. I think it's a big shock to my students just to hear that Jesus was Jewish. Yeah. His, he wasn't Christian. <laughs> there were no Christians. His disciples were Jewish. Yeah. His mother was Jewish. His father, I mean, there were no Christians. So I think for, that's a big shock to them. And, and, and what's so interesting is if you ask them, I always put this in my freshman exam at the end, I always ask, who killed Jesus? At least half the students, if not more, will put the Jews. That's not what the Gospels say. The Gospels say it was the Romans. Yeah. So you ask yourself, okay, where did they get that? Yeah. I don't think pastors, most of the pastors I know don't stand up and say that from the pulpit. So somehow in the telling of the story, this is what gets communicated, that it was the Jews, and I mean the Jews of all time, of every generation who killed Jesus. And all of a sudden, we're not just dealing with a story 2,000 years ago in the Gospel of John, but now all Jews are somehow complicit, yeah. all Jews alive in any time. And all of a sudden you realize what's happened here is that somebody has taken this event of the crucifixion of Jesus and somehow labeled all the Jews of all time responsible, which of course is absurd, right. but it's still, you, you, you see what's happened to this story and the power of narrative here. Yeah. And, and, and we argue about this a lot and talk about what should we do? How should we teach this? Uh, yeah. But we have to teach it. We can't run away from it. Which, which brings us back to one of the, we were talking about in the beginning, which is there are people who say, well, then I am going to stay away from it. Because if I have to read it that carefully, and I can't do the Sunday school version of, of it, mm -hmm. um, and then, then what's the point of diving in this deep? Because I don't have that kind of time in my life, or, you know, or whatever your excuse would be. So that brings us back to, I mean, I remember the first time you know, coming home from Sunday school, and my daughter had learned the story of Noah's Ark. And she was in the back of the car, and it was raining, and she said, I'm on Noah's Ark, and I'm a cat. And all my friends are dying. And it's like the, the story, all of a sudden, the reality of what's happening in that story. And I remember as a parent driving, I was like, what am I going to do now? I mean, I have to, we have to have a deep, meaningful conversation about this really complicated, difficult uh, story. And I was ready to embrace that as a parent. But it, took time. it takes time. And so for people who are saying, why should I bother at all with this, this thing you call scripture, um, if it's that complicated, I want, to, I, I want it far away. It's done, it's done more damage than good. I think, I think several things, but the thing that probably matters most to me is it matters because life is that complicated. Wrestling with those stories trains you to think about the complications that you would better think about 
in, in your business, in your, in your industry, in your own, in your own life. If, if you don't have stories that teach you to ask the hardest questions, like what do you do when you, you're saved and all your, all your kitty friends have died? Mm -hmm. That's a question they will have to ask. Every one of our children will have to ask that sometime in her life because they will sometime be, they be pulled out of the fire when someone else isn't. Uh, those are real questions that are, that are spurred by, by Scripture. But if Scripture is treated as a prescription for the way everything should be, and therefore fathers should take their sons up the mountain to kill them, oh golly, there was a Sunday school lesson, I don't know if I told you about this one, uh, that I read about just this year. Um, I'm, I'm on a I'm in a clergy discussion group online, and someone was uh, wondering what to do with the story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And someone had seen a Sunday school lesson that they suggested using, which said, um, one way to experience this story is to go on a fun camping trip with your dad. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, precisely not that. No. Uh -uh. Because, in fact, the story is supposed to make you ask hard questions. Yeah. Now, the hard questions of that story are not for... And that's not, that's, is not the first question you should ever, ever ask in your life. But those hard questions are native to, to human being. Mm. And if, if Scripture is prescription, I, I, would, I would run from it. If Scripture is provocation then it teaches me to ask the questions I need to ask if I'm going to be a, a responsible human being. Mm. I think when, uh, when Elie Wiesel was here mm. and he was asked about this problem of questions, he, re he recalled that he had written in the book Night. He said when, when he, his, one of his earliest teachers said, do not pray to God for answers, but pray to God for the right questions. That you're never going to be able to run away from the questions because life is like that. You know, life is like that. You know, your brother is sick, your mother is sick, your father, somebody. I mean, this is just what life is. I remember my daughter, Jennifer, when she was 10 years old, starting to read newspapers. It was a big thing. She was start every day she'd look at them. She could read now. She read the newspaper. And she called me in and she was, and we had sung this song. I always sang to them before they went to sleep. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. And she said, Dad, I'm reading this, and there were four little girls that were killed in a fire in Detroit. Dad, where was God? You're talking about God as, has the whole world in his hands. How can he watch this and not? And I said, I think that's a very good question. You should not lose that question. Yeah. I didn't try to give her the, you know, some kind of answer, but I tried to say, listen, that's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, you, you, this is something, you, it's very important, and I think that's really, yeah. that's, you know, that's what I mean by the questions in Jewish tradition again and again. The questions are good. It's not bad. It's actually honest. It's okay. And, and if, if a societal response to the, the, her reading the story of the, the little kids that had been killed, if the societal response is things like that happen, get used to it, yeah. no. Now, that's precisely not the right answer. The song f funds protest. That should not happen if God has the world in God's hands. And given that it does happen, I think that makes children inclined to find a way to make it possible to believe for other little children that, that someone's got them in their hands. It hands us a task. And my students are always shocked when I tell them, Jesus... In the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Matthew, his last words are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. Imagine, those are the last words he says. Why does he end like that with the question? Because he feels abandoned. I mean, and, 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 and I think that's part of, part, of, part of what it is to be a person of faith. And so I think part of what we're both doing is trying to teach people to have a mature faith. What does it mean to trust but to trust without knowing for sure is to live in that tension and to struggle.